everyone. Are we still opening? Oops. I think everyone is in. Well, hello everyone. I'm Rosalind Elder and I am the chair of the Boston Society of Architects Placemaking Network. And that network um, has a mission of trying to encourage more placemaking and public integrated public art in our environment. Uh, we have a series of bi-monthly presentations by various groups around the city that really actively focus on and encourage this, this particular uh, aspect of growing art in the community. And this month, we are going to enjoy a presentation and discussion with uh, Artists for Humanities. Artists for Humanities uh, is a, a mission-driven arts organization that empowers local youth to gain self-sufficiency and employment in art and design. It, it, um, its portfolio includes public art installations, interior and exterior public art murals, environmental graphics, wayfinding graphics, public art sculpture, and street furniture. The, teens, the teenagers at art, Artists for Humanities uh, were the graphic designers for one of the BSAs uh, other networking uh, groups, which was the Race and Architecture Network. So it will give you some idea of the, um, the variety of skills that they have. Artists for Humanity was began in the early 1990s with Susan Rogerson and two teen students, Rob Gibbs and Jason Talbot. And Rob is going to join us tonight. They started that group with the idea to address art, the lack of art experiences within the Boston public school system. And they developed an ambitious, unconventional idea that young people can, through their innate talent and vision, provide creative services to the business communities. So Artists for Humanity developed out of that basic idea and they have developed into a full blown uh, group of art students. Well, they're not really art students. They are an art, um, I want to say, um, 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 incubator <laughs> of students um, that do a wide variety of projects. I think they have over 300 um, art, art uh, students, uh, teenagers with their, with their, under their umbrella. And they teach many more thousands um, who come through their various classes. So tonight we're going to listen to a discussion with um, Rob, uh, Rob Gibbs, who was one of the co-founders. Nevaeh Johnson is one of the student artists at Artists for Humanities. Richard Frank is the director of marketing for Artists for Humanities and myself. And we really, they, they are going to give us a, a presentation of to, to, to introduce to you some of the portfolio of, of services that they offer so that perhaps you and your professional um, um, professional life can incorporate their, their, their wonderful services that they offer. And after that presentation, we're going to have a entertainer conversation so that you can ask them questions, I can ask them questions and we can just learn more about this really wonderful organization. So Richard, would you like to start? I would, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for jumping on and um, appreciate you taking the time to, to share with us tonight. So as Rosalind said, Artists for Humanity has been around for almost 30 years now. We're gonna have a big 30th year anniversary, year long celebration starting in May. So keep your eyes open for a lot of public events that we'll be announcing down the road. But, as Rosalind said, we are a teen arts enterprise. So we're, we're an art and design house like many that you may have partnered with, it contracted 
but we just have the coolest and most skilled and creative Boston teens as our colleagues who all work under professional artist mentors who direct the studios. And we run after school and summer studios for, for Boston teens, almost exclusively Boston public high school students in painting, graphic design, sculpture and 3D design, photography, video and animation. Um, and actually we've just added a print shop and a frame shop and we have a whole exhibitions program where we, we lease and sell our art to commercial spaces and curate for those spaces. And we're probably currently in about 50 different offices now with Artists for Humanity leases. So I thought tonight maybe we'd introduce you to us through some of our recent work. And then I'm gonna bring in my colleagues who really make it all happen at Artists for Humanity. Rob Pro Black Gibbs, who Rosalind mentioned, who's Boston's Artist of the Year with Boston Magazine and uh, Nevaeh Johnson, who's an amazing teen in our sculpture and 3D design studio. But, you know, we're looking to, as always, to partner. You know, you're, you're our entree to um, helping our teens develop their skills, get that social capital that's so important in, in knowing how to relate to the business community as they're doing their work. Um, we respond to briefs, we work with proposals, we work with um, budgets, and we deliver on time. So we're like any other vendor, we're just a little bit cooler, I think. So here we go, let's, let's see if I can share my screen and show you a little bit of recent work we've done for clients over the last year or so. All right, so that's... This is just sort of a exhibition program. We'll jump over that. That's, that's some of the work that we can lease to curate for, for both residential and office space. But in the public realm, we do a lot of mural work. So recently, this is a mural we did this past summer, which was a bit of a challenge, but we did a safe distance mural out on the, uh, by the East Boston Greenway that was part of this Pangea Sea Foundation program where they brought in um, a few a few artists. I think we were one of 15 artists that made a mural speaking to sustainability and climate change. Here's another one we did this summer as well in Upham's Corner, a little bit different, but the same thing. We're really trying to kind of speak to the context that that both the clients looking for and the clients often looking to us to suggest a theme. So this is a building that's gonna be uh, redeveloped for new residential, but it's adjacent to a, a restaurant on, um, on Blue Hill Avenue, uh, Columbia Road, excuse me. And uh, this is a painting we came up that we thought speak, spoke to the community really well as came through one of the ideas of one of our mentors and the teens were out there for about a week and a half creating this. It's the neighborhood seems to have really embraced it. And the, the new building owner, you know, now has this, it's, it's enhanced that building, you know, tremendously. Here's a piece that Rob actually worked on. This was, uh, this was a pivot from the, the Boston Lyric Opera's, you know, indoor performances that they, you know, where they would take over all these venues, now they're going out to the street. So they, they, they retrofitted a mobile van to be able to give um, performances, but they wanted to, this, to speak to the new, the new way they wanna communicate in the neighborhood when they're, when they're giving their show. So they had us do a graffiti treatment that really, you know, it's more of a branding piece on both sides of this mobile opera vans, probably the only mobile opera van in the country that we know of. Here's another, there's a residential spot down in the South Shore that we did a graffiti treatment on an interior wall to kind of jazz up that, the, uh, the look of the lobby. And again, you know, working with the developer, working with the client to come up with an, a concept and then the budget and the execution. Another mural we did out in Hyde Park a summer ago that 
where they're going to redevelop this whole uh, lot here in the foreground into a, a new park for the neighborhood, but they wanted to kick it off with a mural and kind of establish what was kind of a uh, forlorn space into something that people want to hang out in. More placemaking. This was out in Copley Square a couple of years ago. We painted uh, 15 Adirondack chairs through John Hancock, who commissioned us to do one. All of um, images of from famous paintings and famous artists who, you know, whose work I think are seen, many, many of these works are seen in the MFA. The chairs were so well res regarded, I think they disappeared a few of them. So we had to like scramble to put some more out there, but they were, uh, they were really well received. Here's some graphic design work we did with the Boston Marathon in 2019. Um, again, John Hancock was our client. The teens had to uh, come up with this concept and so we can go small or large. Another interior graphic design, um, just kind of puts a little more perspective on the history of the, the neighborhood where this building is situated and it, it complemented an existing mural that was that was adjacent to it, but this is down by the seaport. So we do a lot of graphic murals as well as painted murals. Here's a bike parking spot in the, uh, at the Prudential Center garage. So you needed to brand it a little bit. So that's our version of uh, bike parking. This was a huge wayfinding program that we did for, um, the Guild, it's a school for kids with disabilities out in Concord. And we did the entire school and broke it into all these different um, capsules to communicate what was on the floor and came up with a whole kind of wayfinding system using colors and different neighborhoods, the ocean neighborhood, the neighbor, the forest neighborhood that you can see. And the teens sort of worked through that whole dynamic with the staff to understand how the students would best understand the way to navigate around the school. So that was about a year long, you know, $100,000 commission. That was an incredible experience for, you know, a big group of 12 teens and their mentors who got to put this whole system together. So more of that, that you see at the inside. It also included these interior graphic murals. And actually we're still adding pieces to this now there's a few more that we're going to do that are even of, inter of an interactive nature. This is a piece we really enjoyed. It's sort of uh, it combines you know placemaking, sculpture, and and art. These are these this light up bloom that's out in Assembly Row. So they were we were tasked to see if we could kind of both disguise and and uh, divert some attention away from um, what was being, you know, a torn up area that was being uh, transformed into new construction. But in the meantime, they wanted people to have a place to sit and enjoy as they were traversing through this space on the way into the Assembly Rose stores. So we came up with these light up Alice in Wonderland like flowers that are also double as benches. And it's all done with uh, neon lights and our own design. We were able to make this in our own shop because we've we've created mm. quite a nice maker space now in our facility. So we have the we have the ability to create some large scale furniture and installations in house. Um, another piece, an interior piece for the Nixon Peabody Law Law Offices. These were their new offices downtown. And we've got work on four floors of the new office, including this piece, which is a collage of 336 um, six inch square collage tiles, all made from reclaimed magazines that we collect. Um, and each tells an individual story. So not only do you get the storytelling of the piece, you have the storytelling of the teens that made the piece. And we bring that to every project that we do as well. Another piece in the Prudential Center, um, I think it was a real close up high resolution photo taken of one of those collaged 
pieces that we make on those revision tiles that you saw in the previous slide, but this was blown up so we could, um, it was one of those stores that was, you know, coming soon, but they wanted to kind of cover over an empty space. And we were able to license them this piece of art and blow it up to a very high resolution so it looks as beautiful as it does. We're big on artistic bike racks. You know, you've got a lot of projects and you people are thinking about transportation and new styles of transit. And we've done multiple projects where we put artistic bike racks into neighborhoods, both for developers, for community groups, for Main Street groups. This is one in the Fenway. And we thought it was like, would be kind of cool if we were literally said Fenway in the bike rack to brand it. And so you'll, there are four of these now down by the Landmark Center in the Boylston and Brookline Avenue area. So it, it's street sculpture, you know, combined with the functional street um, utility of having this really cool bike rack. And we designed that and we're, you know, we're able to fabricate as well now. And Neve, I think you, you work in that studio. I don't know if you worked on this project directly, um, but Neve, you want to talk a little about this, these, um, some of the bike racks we did in Austin and Brighton? Um, yes. So as Rich said, these are some bike racks and they essentially were just to tell the story of the neighborhoods, which I thought was really interesting, both in designing, because like most people know, these aren't like most artists, these aren't our final designs. So we had to constantly like research the history of Austin, research the neighborhood, learn about the people, learn about the culture that has created, that's been created over there over the last couple of decades and then translate that into art that's not only usable and people can hook their bikes into it, but also tell a story and connect with the neighborhood. Something to give people, something to just stop at if they're walking by, they see the Austin sign or the gear. They even interestingly found an old train that used to be that used to be um, shaped like the orange line, but it was green. Yeah. And so it's not as well. Oh, that's it. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. So the and the teens are coming up with these con concepts with their with their mentors, who in in another setting might be called the studio directors, but they're the mostly young professional artists, many of whom are alumni of our program, which is super cool. So they've had the experience of going through Artists for Humanity as teens, then continued on in college and in, um, in their professional practice, come back into the studio and then bring all that institutional knowledge and guidance and love to the teens who, who when they come to work at Artists for Humanity, actually they, they leave their student hat at the door and we call them teen artists and designers. So, it's just a, an amazing experience, both for you as architects to work with us. And then we would invite you to bring your clients in and participate in that experience too. So the whole, the whole process of working with us is very engaging. And um, especially these days, as people are thinking about how does, you know, how can we engage community? How do we get more community voice, more the voice of people from the neighborhood in the building, how do we get, how do you establish more buy-in for projects? How do you maybe get a little less resistance? We're, uh, we're a good facilitator for all of that. I think we have a lot of credibility um, in the professional sphere amongst developers and with many architects and nothing leaves our, leaves our studio unless it's at a, you know, the highest standard and we're, um, we create a really good making of story that's you know brings added value to every every process. This was you know something we've just started to embark on. And unfortunately, it'd be great to see it in video, but this was a whole projection art series. So bring us some of your buildings, and we'll map a projection art show onto it. So this, we're doing that of late, and this this one this summer was a three night projection art festival where we did it on three consecutive nights, once um, in, at the Strand Theater in Upham's Corner, the next night on the Haley House in Roxbury, and then on J.P. Licks in Jamaica Plain, all mapped to the building with the teens art that came during the 
this pandemic and kind of uh, social reckoning period that we're still going through. And it, our teens have a lot to say. We figured let's get it up on the wall and have people react to it. We do a lot of motion graphics too. So we can do video and animation, um, both put that inside of lobbies. We can do a lot of uh, making of videos. We can create a video about any projects you're working on. So speak to us about any motion graphic video needs you might have. So that's just a, that's just a touch of what Artists for Humanity has done, continues to do both virtually and hopefully when we get back into our beautiful studios in South Boston, which we all welcome you to as soon as we're back in. But I wanna turn it now to my colleague and the co-founder of Artists for Humanity, Rob Pro Gibbs Black, to um, Rob Pro Black Gibbs, to uh, talk a little more about the integration of art into architecture and how the community voice is is so important when you're thinking about projects. So, Rob, take it away. I uh, appreciate that, Rich, and uh, welcome to everybody that's present at this uh, presentation. It's good to have everybody here and uh, checking us out and lending us an ear for the time. Um, as Rich said, I'm one of the co-founders to the organization that we've, that's been around for the past 30 years. And what we love to do at the organization, we love to highlight the strengths of both the young people and the young adults that work there, a lot of which are alumni of the program. And um, what we pride ourselves on is walking the talk. Okay, it's cool to be in a building and um, you know sharpen these skills and, and, and expose our teens and ourselves to things that are going to be transferable skills so that they're, you know, they're coming out more involved in committed young people and adults. But it's also cool when you make that connection from like the neighborhoods that a lot of people are from and for people in the community to see us active so that, you know, the name Artists for Humanity is not only said right, but people understand us through what we do. Um, I've recently had a, 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 a very successful practice outside of the studio because um, a lot of times the things that you're teaching and that you're going through with the clients and the jobs and projects that we work on, um, for the mentors to be able to lead these particular projects with a, with a level of confidence, your own practice has to like, you know, embody that. And um, from those experiences that I've had in the studio, along with other young people who've been able to um, activate community projects, working with developers who were looking to extend pretty much an olive branch to the neighborhoods to speak on like, you know, anything that's of historical context, anything that connects stories to attention for people to carry out those narratives. Um, recently just worked on something that's at the gateway of what's now called Nubian Square in Roxbury. And it's on the um it's on a development that's on the corner of Molina Cass and Charmet Ave. It's um it's from a neighborhood I personally grew up around and from a project that I was working on previously, I've caught the attention of some young people who were looking to help out and contribute towards whatever the next project was. Um instantly I snapped into AFH mentor mode <laughs> and was like, listen, here's what we can do when the next project comes up, just be ready for it. And with this developer, we've been working with, um, you know, just kind of getting a design approved for the past two years. Um, it was going on two years and with the whole pandemic and everything happening, it pushed it up a little further, but it was right on time because with the, um, the recent celebration of uh, Dr. King's birthday, we was able to reveal a love story between he and uh, Coretta Scott over at the um, development. So if I could share my screen and just share everybody, show everybody um, the process, this would be cool. Get it to a full screen. All right. So as you can see, this is the development with nothing on it. Um, the developer was very interested in doing something that would connect the neighborhood to help them feel invited to this property that just came up out of the ground. It's um, historically located where 12 Baptist Church used to be at, where uh, Coretta and Martin were um, practicing and rooming to meet 
over here. So Rob, I have so, one, one question. Is that a commercial space or a residential? It's both. One half is commercial and the other half is residential. So this mural is on the residential side facing the, um, the Mandela Towers and it's right down the street from uh, Canfield Gardens and Lenox Street Projects. So it's right. literally the, the gateway to, to Robsburg. So, so, so Rob, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. So what, what street is this face is this facing? Is this Milner Cap? This is this is Shamed Ave. But if oh, you were Shaman coming, Avenue. okay, yeah, Shamed Ave. But if you was going down Molina Cass, as if you was going towards um, Mass Ave or mm -hmm. towards ninety three, you you can look to the left and see this building. Okay, plain great. As well. Thank you. All right. So the developer shared this idea of uh, trying to do a mural on the side of, of uh, these two cinder block facades, and um. It was it was kind of like a okay how could we make a connection and tell this story and give like a you know give some level of attention um, with the next these are the proposed ideas that you see this is a um a sketch that was just you know digitally imposed onto the building and it was kind of the, one of the ideas that we were going to go ahead with but a year later we came to a decision to put. <laughs> a hero to this piece, which was the phone conversation between Coretta and Martin. Um, it was it was said that like he met her over a phone conversation and was in love with her voice. And that was kind of the first time that they met. He was going to BU. She was up at the New England Conservatory, residents of Boston. And then, you know, not too much later, they have got married. So to be able to share this level of history and story between two icons in the, in, the, in the Black community, it was just great. So let me see. I'm trying to move it on to a final version. Uh-oh, here we go. So this is what it turned out to be, as you've seen it from the rough scale to the final presentation on the wall and this is existing right now there's been a lot of um media a lot of turn a lot of traffic going through here there were uh, a few protests that rerouted their you know their march to, to go in front of this piece and here's the body of young people along with one of the mentors who worked on the piece who are residents in the area and you know live literally across the street from this so this is just a perfect example of how uh the practices that we have in AFH, we take it to the street and we walk the talk. And this has just been a proud moment to show this connection between Martin and Coretta with the, uh, with the, with the old school telephone line connecting the two. Young people were like, what are they holding? I'm like, it's a telephone. <laughs> Cause everybody's so used to a smartphone, but um, this is just one of the ways where we're just uh, educating a lot of folks old and young and just having like, you know, community awareness in reference to just the conversations that get started because things of this nature really never existed around the neighborhood to this level of impact. So this is just an example of working with a client who's a, um, you know, a developer and taking what they've had and turning it into this piece where it's, you know, it's a, it's a huge attraction and a new landmark add into the landscape of the city. All right. Okay, so is this, um, Richard, is, is that the end of the presentation? We're ready for questions and conversation. Oh, excellent. Okay, if anyone has any questions, can you put them in the chat and I will um, sort of share them with the group? And while we're waiting for those questions to, to come up, I, I have a few questions to start actually. Um, and I guess my question basically starts at, I don't know if we made it obvious, but Artists for Humanity actually pays their teens. And as I recall, I think you were paying them um, at a fairly high, <laughs> hourly rate before the federal government even raised the minimum wage. So I think that's something you really need to be uh, applauded for because it's not just teens coming in and 
voluntarily, you know, working on projects in sort of an internship type capacity where they get the experience, but, you know, they don't get money. They, these teams actually get paid. So I think that's really something that I did not uh, highlight when I introduced you early. And I really want everyone to be aware of that. Um, so, so, so my, my question is, um, sort of the, how do you start these projects? Like I was, I, my first question was, how do you start a mural project? But I jumped down when you finish up, Rob, with the Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King mural. And I'm wondering, you know, you mentioned the developer a lot. Where, where do the architects come in? How much involvement do you have with the architects in developing these projects and the project concepts? Um, how much involvement you have with the architects? That's a real good question. They lay out the schematics, give us the blueprints, and give us like scale and size mm -hmm. in reference to the wall. Let us know like what are the um the, the type of materials that we can use, okay. and um just kind of like you know safety precautions and things of that nature. Um, the 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 materials that the building's made out of, so we can make the best decisions on what's going to be like long lasting mural paint. Mm -hmm to make sure that, you know, it doesn't look bad within a couple of months. You know, we live in New England, so there's nine months of bad weather. And we just got to make sure that we put the right application onto things so that um it lasts. And okay. yeah, pretty much that's, and, and when I spoke with the developer, he's an architect for the mm. building. Okay. So that was, that, that was kind of a, a two for one to sit there and just, um and he's an enthusiast, he's, he's, he's an art enthusiast, a collector. So he was just kind of like, I want to do something that extends which pretty much olive branch to the community. But I have this wall that seems to be the perfect. It was like, you know, a cultivation between he thought this was perfect. He was just like, there's only one problem. There's a gap in between the building. It's about 24 feet wide. You know, he's giving us all the schematics. And I was mm -hmm. like, that's cool. We could do something that will visually connect them together. Mm -hmm. And that was just, you know, a plan with space. So right. that's how... In that in that particular project, the architect came in in the play. Oh, okay. And Rosalind, if I can if I can piggyback with with Rob, in in general, you know we we love to get in in the you know in the design phase. So that's why we're we're we want to introduce ourselves to your community. We work with architects frequently and developers, but I think if you we can help you tell the story of why. A building should have a mural or there should be placemaking or maybe you're landscape architects and you want to put a you know there's an open space that needs uh, a 3d installation it's a carousel it's a it's a sculpture it's something that reflects the brand whatever it is and then you have you know we should we'd love to get in the initial plans you know maybe mm -hmm. the facade of the building calls for something large scale now that could be it could be a a sculptural piece or it could be a painted piece it could be a mixed media piece we we work in all media so we're 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 suggesting that you know integrate the art into your concepts and not make that the afterthought that mm -hmm. you know we want you know that this new boston to be a boston that's you know embraced at street level not as much like when you're, you know, what we're seeing, see so much in the seaport of these kind of foreboding large buildings that don't seem to want to bring people in. We think if we can start to work together where it makes sense and get a piece of a project with you, not only will it help you in terms of pitching your concept to, to the developer that you have this relationship with Artists for Humanity, but but everybody who sees your work afterward, I think will get a lot of pleasure out of, out of what we are able to create under your direction and partnership. So we're happy to talk about any projects that you're, you're pitching right now that are in the works, um, how we can think about tailoring something that we do with what you're making or, um, even add on to something that's already been started, but there may be a good spot for bringing in Artists for Humanity art because it's, it's really like the most invaluable community art investment you can make probably in, in the city. And, and there's no other enterprise like Artists for Humanity in the entire country. 
We are the largest employer of teens in the, in the whole city of Boston. Mm -hmm. As Rose said, we employ 350 teens a year and they come out with incredible skills, social capital, empowered. We've got amazing young people like Nevea, who's gonna probably not go on to be an artist, but wants to be a child psychiatrist, but it's gonna take all her skill set from that she's picked up in AFH and bring that into her career. So this is this is sort of where the new the new world is, and we we're here to help you guys. Yeah. We, we have a question in the chat. If um, someone wants to talk about community engagement, the community engagement process. And the question is, do the teens have the chance to interview or engage with the local residents to help inform the designs? Um, can, can, uh, can, well, let's, Nivelle, did you, how much did participation did you have when you were working on the bike racks? Um. It was both a lot and a little. Oftentimes, the, the bike racks we're working on, people actually live in the neighborhood. So they're there every day. They go home there, their family's there. So they get the engagement of like being there all the time. They know what it's like on the weekend. They know the people, they know their neighbors down the street, the people who live in the community. And then also we do a lot of research on like the history of the neighborhood, who lives there now. And oftentimes, because of COVID, we haven't been able to, but oftentimes we go visit the site that we're thinking of working on. So like if someone says, hey, I want you to design something for this building, then we'll take a field trip and we'll go down to the neighborhood. We'll mm -hmm. look at the building. We'll look at the businesses that are around it. We'll look at the people who stop there. And oftentimes they end up asking us what we're doing because they see a group of teenagers walking around. So sometimes we'll be like, we're just looking through the neighborhood and we'll have a conversation with the people who live there. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of community engagement. A lot of times we try and think about what the community would like to see, what the community would like to be. Mm -hmm. so what the community process would, what the piece would like to reflect about the community, not only for the, for the person who's commissioned the artwork, of course, but for those people who are going to have to see it every day, who walk by it. Okay, and another question, Nevea, for you specifically, back to the bike racks. Did you help in the manufacturing process, or you know, if Nevea didn't, Richard, maybe you you a, a rock and jump in. But I'm just curious, because Richard, you mentioned that you have a maker space in your building. And one other thing before I forget, I do want to mention that the building, Artists for Humanity building, was the first uh, lead platinum building in the city of Boston by. Um, 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 Aerosmith. So not only, are, not only are they doing a state of the art, innovative uh, art, uh, art concepts, but they're in a state of the art building. But but so I want to get back to that. Navia, did you um, participate in the manufacture of those bike racks, or were they done in your facility, Richard? So how did that happen? Uh, I'll jump in, Navia, for the on this one. I, it depends. In the past, we were sending that out for fabrication, but we mm -hmm. have more capability now. So, depending on what we're working on, we may be able to make it there. And you know, in steel, sometimes we still need to send stuff out because we don't have the we don't have the the equipment that makes that. So we work through a fabricator, but the whole design process is is ours. Other things that you know we can make. So the the we're, we're making more in-house than we had up until a year or two ago when we added this whole maker space because we, we expanded our building about two and a half years ago and added 30,000 square feet to our original 23 and gave us a lot more capability. Oh, okay. Uh, we have a shout out here from uh, someone, I guess, joining us from Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. Um, yeah. They said they live there now after three decades and they, um, what is it saying? Is it, uh, oh, they worked with you. They worked yeah. with you uh, over we'll the that. course of two years. So, so that's something. Yeah. Someone else wants to know, when do you meet um, on it, on weekday working mornings or work days or weekends? And I'm not sure if they mean for the students or I assume they mean, when do the students meet at your studio? Right. Rob, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, not a problem. Not a problem. Um, 
we meet with the with the participants during the school year on Tuesday, Wednesdays, Thursdays from three to six, which is an after school session. And then in the summertime, we um we add two days onto the week and we elongate the time two hours. So in the summertime, it's from twelve to five thirty. And then um in the in the is it daily? Year, that's daily. So in the summertime, okay. we go from Monday to Friday. And during the school year, it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from three to six. So it's about nine hours a week during the school year, 25 hours a week in the summertime. Okay. But during during the day hours when the teens aren't there, our professional staff are working and prepping these projects. So we're we're working on client projects all day long, Monday through Friday. The teens jump in with us during those those hours that Rob mentioned. And we we do work on weekends if we're doing production and murals, you'll we'll we'll be out on weekends. We do a lot of We've done a lot of live art on weekends at, at events, and we're looking forward to getting back to that too. So, we're, can you can you explain what you mean by live art? Yeah, well, we we have we do a number of different things, including interactive paintings. So we'll we'll create a painting, but it could be a mural, a large scale mural that we will pre-compose with the client. As a line starts as a line illustration, and then we'll fill it, we'll complete it with a group of guests, whether it's a corporate group, a, re, a, a residential group, a community group, all working together at this large scale piece, um, filling it in. It's all composed of small cells and, and spaces, and we kind of we can be very improvisational or we can be very you know, we can be very directed as to colors and and shapes. And then that piece finishes over in a prescribed amount of time, usually in a few hours with the teens working as both the art directors and the co-creators right around, right along with that guest group. And then the client keeps the piece. So it's a really great way to kick off um, for a grand opening of a project. And then the if we would make that mural maybe with all the residents, it can hang inside the lobby. So we have lots of creative ideas. We're a, we're a creative bunch. So come to us with any kind of marketing ideas you have too, because we, we realize that you know the world takes some capital and it takes a little bit of commercial thought sometimes to, to get people enticed to do something. So we wanna, we wanna build value both from a community base, but from a commercial base and do it the right way. So I think there's there's really no better partner to that has that intersection in artists for humanity. We have we have several other questions here. Uh, one question is how difficult is the art proposal uh, to get approval from the community? And um, I'm not sure that I quite understand how difficult is the art proposal proposed. Oh, so I guess the question is, do you have to get a lot of community approvals for your various proposals? Or do you, because you work so intimately with your developers, that's not necessary, perhaps? Um, I mean, if it's public art and it's a mural, it may, you know, a certain, depending where it is, it might have to go in front of the Art Commission for approval for certain things. I mean, a lot of our stuff, if it's on, you know, if it's private, we don't. So it really depends, but we're, we attend all the meetings. Matter of fact, we're, one of the reasons we had to change our um, lineup tonight a little bit is our, one, our other co-founder, Jason Talbot, who Rosalind mentioned, is at a meeting of the BPDA tonight because we're, we're um, party to a developer's proposal for an, another new project in Roxbury that would house a, a, an art center on the ground floor. And so we're in there, you know, we're there to support their proposal tonight um, at the meeting. And we go to a lot of community meetings and wherever we need to be to support your project, we go. Okay, another question is how do you find those uh, mentors are those pro that professional staff that works with the students who work with the students? I'm throwing that to Rob. <laughs> I keep clicking the wrong button for unmute. I'm sorry about that. Um, we fortunately been able to have a lot of our alumni who went off to college wow. and come back become a mentor. So, um, like let's say in the, uh, the paint studio, for instance, that I direct, uh, all the mentors, with the you know exception of two, were. P 
people that I personally had in my group and mentored. So it's it's the you know it's the it's the the tear passing down the you know the information and they they come back from you know pursuing their, their higher education and wanting to share what they learn eagerly with the with the young people. Wonderful. So um, yeah, a lot of our mentors are alumni of the program. Okay. An- another mm-hmm. question is how are your teams selected and uh, do you ever work with uh, local art schools? We work with high schools throughout the city of Boston. Like we're, we're Boston focused. We usually have an open house that welcomes everybody to come through. And from that open house, we try to generate an attraction just so that um, young people that come through or like, you know, the guidance counselors that are advised that they come there, we kept a consistent schedule so they can come and see the place in action. From that open house, they fill out uh, um, like an application online, mm-hmm. which we try to get them back in on to have an interview. And our interviewers are team leaders that I self-identified in the program. So once they go through that interview process and um, can make the commitment towards the time and such, we onboard them to then, you know, try to commit towards a 36 hour apprenticeship, which helps them kind of navigate through the work, their personal, you know, um, their personal commitments and just school, you understand? So I tell a lot of teens that when they come to the studio, if this is their first job, it's actually their third job because they got things that we know we try to connect the, the messaging with home so that they have all the attention and, and the support they need both from outside and inside to make it there. And after the 36 hour um, apprenticeship, we hire them and, and pay them a minimum wage rate in the studio that they've, um, that they chose to be in and just, you know, get the jobs going. So that's mm-hmm. usually that's a that's a very shrunk version of our of our recruitment process, but a okay. lot of it comes from word of mouth. And and I just want to share that Artists for Humanities also um, I don't think you do it now, but maybe but pre pandemic you used you you had um, uh, basically open studios for the pub, general public to come and visit your facility and sort of gain an understanding of what you do. Uh, what is the status of that, and do you plan to resume it um, uh, at what point in the near future, or just what 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 is the status of those open studios, those general public open studios? Um, I'll I'll take that one. They we hope to resume them for sure as soon as we it's safe to do so and everybody feels comfortable. And that was well, they generally they were the last Wednesday of every month from five to seven, so we're we're itching to get back to that as soon as possible. And we're in the midst of developing kind of a couple new virtual approaches to that as well. So I just put um, my email and our, uh, our tag in the, in the chat. If you follow us at, at AFH Boston, but it's, we're AFH Boston on Twitter and on Instagram. And um, You'll see all our latest announcements, be able to follow all the things that we're, we've got coming up in this 30th anniversary. We would love to partner. Um, and please come through for Open Studios and bring your, bring your clients there too, because mm-hmm. seeing the teens engaged in the work is uh, the best advertisement that we can have because they are, that's, that's what we're about. We're just about um, empowering them, giving them a voice, giving them a space, giving them the support, and then finding out how to how to make something that's going to delight you and your clients and really engage engage everybody. Yeah, here's another question um, for anyone on the panel team. It's about the building. It's, the question is: Have you worked on any other lead projects? other than your building and um, where the, the participants can get lead credit for community engagement or innovation or any of the other credits that um, our projects can receive for being particularly sensitive around community engagement or, or uh, innov- innovative um, technology or sustainable design. So what has been your experience on working on other buildings that perhaps have um, are trying to get lead credit. Oh, well, have you 
been involved in that at all? Um, I don't know. I don't have a specific answer other than we love to work in a lot of reclaimed and sustainable materials. So that's, that's kind of our thing. And if that helps people get their lead credits, we're all for it. I know we've worked, you know, we've, We've worked with Arrow Street um, when they were building out their new offices. I'm trying to think of what other lead buildings that we came into. I'm sure we've worked and done interior projects in a lot of lead buildings and maybe have our art in a lot of lead buildings, but I don't know that we've done it as a signature piece, but this is the perfect opportunity. That's why we're here, guys. That's, that's what we need you guys for. So let's do it. Okay, another question is, can you describe your smallest project and your largest project? Oh, wow. Um, I don't know. The smallest project could be like a key ring or something we've done. We, we have a store at Faneuil Hall, so we've made a lot of stuff for retail. So we've done, we do some really small, cool art. And the largest project, what do you think, Rob? I don't um, well, I'm going to say the, the smallest project is when we started out 30 years ago. Yeah. There were six of us. And the largest project is that there's 350 teens to this day. So um, don't, don't, don't forget paid teens. Paid oh, teens. teens. That yeah. goes that without that, saying. That's, that a, goes that's a better saying. answer. Much better. <laughs> uh, uh, another just, just, just for, and I'll, I'll probably, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this because we haven't, we haven't signed it yet, but we're, a large project and at least in a large space that we're we're about to work on is we're going to be doing placemaking at at the the um, transformation of Suffolk Downs Ooh. into a so I'm sure you're all familiar with that project. They brought us to kind of wrangle the track and the grandstand into something new that's going to start to rebrand that whole. Um, project and make it something that's inclusive, beautiful, and uh, Instagrammable. We got to see what we're <laughs> going to come up with. Wonderful. Uh, another comment. Looks like you have a potential client here. I saw that. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, let me see. I oh, I did, I, ha I have a few more questions or, or comments, and the comments would be really. I encourage people to go to. Artists for Humanities website because the slides they showed were just a small, small fraction of the variety of projects that they work on. And what you didn't show, you, you showed the Aaron, 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 Dundike, um, Aaron Dundike chairs, but you didn't show any of the other furniture projects. So they have worked on quite a few other furniture projects. I think you did a couple of furniture items for Aerosmith Smith as well. Yeah. I got called from the website. Yeah, using your, using your um, their blueprints actually to make a lot of furniture from the, from their their own schematics. We made that these modular furniture pieces that are all through their office. Okay, so so I really encourage people to go to the website and and check that out. Um, let me see if I have any more questions. Did anyone have another question? Um, I wanted to say something that um, yes, you seem to send out and mention. Another cool thing about AFH is that a lot of the artists there actually get to sell their work. Mm. So in my studio, we do collages with, re with repurposed magazines. So we're able to create our own designs and put it up for people to buy. And I know that the painting studio also has that option. I'm not really familiar with the other studios, but we also, not only do we get to work on bigger client projects, we also, as smaller artists, get to put our work out there. So I've had people buy my pieces for their home as gifts for family members and friends. So not only do, that's one of the most incredible things about AFH is not only like you get the real business professional aspect, but you also get the independence to like sell your work, put the work you want to create out there and you have the opportunity to make money on it off of it. So not only do you have somewhere to sell it, have a business, have somewhere reputable that like people come to for the purpose of looking at art, but you also get commission on top of that, which just adds to the pay team, the whole pay team thing. But that's a cool opportunity that offer, AFH offers and they do tutoring, which is one of, I have to say, one of my saving graces. Did I phrase? Yeah. 
I didn't hear the last piece, Nevaeh. Well, they offer tutoring, and so students who are struggling in school, and yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's another incredible uh, component of it. So you're really creating well-rounded individuals. And one thing, Richard, you mentioned earlier that Nevaeh uh, may not, you know, may not necessarily become a working artist in the future, but I think what we cannot discount are the skills that uh, thinking creatively will sort of enable her to sort of pursue her other options in the future. Um, I think that, you know, there have been so many studies that show or indicate that, you know, being trained in creative enterprises really enhances a person's ability to think, um, think in a flexible way to sort of just be more creative about everything, everything you do. So, um, I, 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 you know, yes, you know. <laughs> She will become a creative psychologist or creative jewelry designer, creative whatever it is she wants to pursue in the future. Uh, this, let me see. I don't, I, I, one of my early questions was what happened to those Adirondack, Adirondack, sorry, Adirondack chairs, but you answered that, Richard, that they started to disappear. I think, I think a couple disappeared and then we had to bring them inside in the winter. So, um, they may they may reappear, but uh, <laughs> they were they were well loved. Let's put it that way. That's wonderful. Oh yeah, there's some some other pieces. What is this? We're looking at. Oh, this is a back. Is this them under construction? Somebody just put that up, Tom. Oh. I think. Oh, they're, these these are in storage. They is saying. My audio. Okay, there we go. That's a follow up to my previous comment. Those are the bike racks that were done in the South End um, three about three years ago. So that was they were in storage at this point. They're, they they were installed about two years ago on Washington Street, and I'm not okay. sure if others have been done or not. I just wanted to show them as an example. That's stainless steel, and we we had to work with the City of Boston to get those approved because the Department of Transportation of the city has oversight over all the bike racks in the city. So. That was, uh, was it was a probably a two year process. It could have even been longer. There were some stops and starts in there, but uh, th I know these were fabricated off site, and then we had to have them stored for a while because we had to get the permission from the city to get them installed. But it all worked out um, pretty well in, in the long run. But oh, yeah, no. I just uh, sorry I don't have one in situ, but they they are installed. One in the corner of Mass Ave and uh, Washington Street is a one that I can remember for sure. Great. Wonderful. Are there any other questions? Or panelists, did you want to add something more? Um, I just put in the chat, which, I, which I'll reiterate verbally, that we, we really appreciate everybody taking the time to come and learn about us. We would love to just meet everybody, even if we don't, you don't have anything to collaborate on now. If you just even just want to reach out, um, I'd be happy to send you our portfolios. Um, stay in touch, get your email. So thank you so much for all the work that you're doing and making uh, Boston like a pretty amazingly cool architectural place these days with a lot of vibrancy. And uh, let's, let's meet up and see what we can do together. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I think that's it for tonight. I really want to thank everyone for joining us uh, at this presentation. And again, I really encourage you to go to Artists for Humanities, which is afhboston.org, their website, and you will see lots of really incredible images to inspire you. And you, you know, you really will want to work with this group. Um, so I, I encourage you to do that. Uh, our next presentation, um, placemaking presentation will be in March. It's bi-monthly now. So, and uh, we will be sending out uh, um, information about that via the BSA website in, this, in the future. So I hope you will join us for that. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you, Richard, uh, Rob, Rob, and Nevea. Thank you so much. You're so inspiring. Thank you. So we're going to close out now.
Thanks for having us, Sean. Thank you.